I think uh, I, I should be placed in a position where I can no longer inflict harm upon others. This is Colin Ireland. On January the 1st, 1993, he made a New Year's resolution to become a serial killer. In just three months, he brutally murdered five men. Tonight, the full story of his reign of terror told for the first time by the man himself. In his own words, Colin Ireland reveals how and why he killed again and again. I, I went and got a plastic bag from the kitchen, carrier bag, and I stuck it over his head. Got a bit of a struggle, and I killed him quickly, very quickly. Colin Ireland was a nobody, and he thought the best way to be a somebody was to become a serial killer. His killing spree in London in the 1990s was short and brutal. He killed five gay men, four of them, in just 15 days. He became known as the Gay Slayer. Although born in the 1950s, Ireland's early life reads like a chapter from a Dickens novel. Born in a former workhouse in Kent, he and his 17-year-old mother were abandoned by his father. Over the next six years, they were forced to move homes nine times. He didn't speak about his, um, his past at all, really. He kept that very much to himself. Um, he did mention once about um, coming home from school and his, his mother had moved, which uh, does tend to make you feel a bit sympathetic towards somebody. In later life, he ran away to London, drifting between unskilled jobs and petty crime. He also claimed to have been the victim of a sexual assault by a man. In 1989, though, it seemed he'd finally found some security. After a whirlwind romance, he married Janet Young. It doesn't seem like the same person to me. That isn't the person I knew. That isn't the person I was married to. Looking back, he had a very difficult childhood and youth. I didn't know he'd been in prison except once. It seems a very poor excuse for what he did, but um, who knows how people's minds work. The marriage certainly didn't work, and at the start of 1993, now in South End, Ireland made the decision that would change his life forever. Bitter about his past and his present, he planned a future as a multiple murderer. And like many who had gone before him, he sought out easy targets. If you want to be a serial killer, and Ireland certainly wanted to be a serial killer, then you look for people who are vulnerable. Hitchhikers, people running away from the law, homosexuals and prostitutes. Ireland's victims would be gay men, many of whom lived double lives, anxious to conceal their sexuality from their families. His hunting ground, a West London pub where questions weren't asked and where gay men could find casual partners. On the 8th of March, he paid his first visit, still unsure whether to begin his killing spree. I think it, it's something that's been triggering me some time before. That I felt if I was approached, I felt there was a likelihood that I would kill. Um, I thought to myself, if I'm approached, something will happen. If I'm not, it would have been quite likely I, I would have gone on my way and maybe nothing would have happened. Right, um, can I get a cloth of water, please? Also in the pub that evening was Peter Walker, a 45-year-old West End theatre director. The men talked and arranged to spend more time together. We went in a cab to his flat in Battersea. I work nearly every night, so it's nice to have a bit of company, to be honest. I put on a pair of gloves on the way. Uh, my intentions were different to him. According to Ireland, when they got home, Walker agreed to be tied up as part of a sex game. 
Once he'd bound him to the bed, Ireland delivered a vicious and ultimately lethal beating. While he was tied up, I, I went and got a plastic bag from the kitchen, carry it back, and I stuck it over his head. And I think in a way he wanted to die. I think in a way he probably didn't even realise it, but I, I detected him in this, in this, this lack of desire to carry on. And I, I think he knew he was going to die, and he was, he was quite controlled about it. It was almost like a, a thing that was going to happen. It was like almost like a fake thing. With his first victim dead, Ireland erased all traces of himself from the flat. An avid reader of true crime books and FBI manuals, he knew how important it was to be meticulous. Surfaces were cleaned, clothes changed, and everything he had bought was packed up, ready to be disposed of. He also rifled through Walker's possessions, taking his credit cards, but he was in no hurry to leave. This was to become Ireland's post-killing ritual. He'd clean up the murder scene and then, worried about attracting attention by leaving in the middle of the night, he'd stay with the body until the morning, often just casually watching TV. I remember after Walker looking in the mirror, I mean, I walked down the road and I thought, I must see it in my face. I've just murdered someone. They must be able to tell. They must just by, by looking at me. I remember losing my virginity. You know, and I remember that same feeling then. It was like you were almost buzzing. The following day, Ireland withdrew money using Walker's bank cards. He destroyed them and, along with keys he had taken, threw them into the Thames from Battersea Bridge. On the train home to South End, he disposed of his murder kit, hurling it into a canal. It would be another 24 hours before his first victim was discovered. About uh, 10 to 1, got the call down to where Peter Walker lived. He'd been found dead by the caretaker. Peter was uh, lying in bed. He had a duvet pulled over him and his feet were sticking out. There was, curiously, two teddy bears positioned on top of the duvet in an inverted position, you could say the 69 position. Uh, he had a condom on his nose, trailed across his cheek, and he had another condom in his mouth. Police would later discover the reason why the body was left this way. Ireland had discovered Walker was HIV positive. Furious he wasn't told, he wanted to humiliate him, leaving objects on his body in a ritualistic way. In South End, Ireland was concerned. His first murder had attracted no publicity. Unaware that the police had already found the body, he called the Samaritans. He wasn't looking for help, he was looking for recognition. Can I just ask what the address is for? Will you just listen? There are two dogs and they've been locked in a room for two days. At five o'clock that evening, we got a message from the Samaritans. They'd received a call from a chap who had given them Peter's name, his address, and he got quite agitated when pushed for further information. Because the owner's dead. I killed him. Ireland felt his call hadn't been taken seriously, so an hour later he dialed again, this time to the Sun newspaper. I worked at the Sun a long time, and I've, I've never taken a call like that. I just literally picked up the phone. Um, to a man who started talking about two dogs locked in a flat, then just suddenly dropped this bombshell that, that the owner of the flats was still in there and that he'd murdered the owner of this flat. Certainly in America you get situations where the uh, killer plays with the media and that's part of the, 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 the buzz they get out of it. But in, in the 1990s we hadn't had that situation arise in England. He wanted attention almost from day one. It was clear that he wanted to be uh, a star of the newspapers. It was my New Year's resolution to kill a homosexual. He was a homosexual and into that kinky sex. You're into all that stuff, aren't you? He, he wasn't panicky, he, he wasn't angry. He didn't sound like someone who just tied up a man, murdered him. He just sounded relatively cool and calm and collected, really. The first call was to Scotland Yard. About two hours later, they came back 
and basically confirmed everything. They'd found the body, the dogs, the whole story was, was confirmed. To display such an arrogance, such bravado at this stage there meant that we didn't have the run-of-the-mill murder on our hands here. There was someone here who um, need, needed to be caught as quickly as possible. After discovering more about the victim's background, the police made a TV appeal for help. I've been joined now by Detective Inspector Martin Finnegan, who is investigating Peter Walker's death. We therefore need to hear from anybody, whether it be customers, cab drivers, anybody at all, who saw him after 5pm that Monday evening, the 8th of March. Within hours, it became apparent that uh, we're dealing with uh, a death of a member of the, of the gay community. You've got to remember that we're talking about people's sex lives here. If someone's gay and their immediate family or relatives or work colleagues don't know, that's exactly the way they want to leave it. That was a concern to us because our priority was investigating Peter's murder. And if they chose not to tell us about the, their activities, then of course uh, we had nothing to investigate. Persuading the wider gay community to cooperate proved even more difficult than the police thought. Back in 1993, their relations with the police were non-existent. Looking back now, it seems extraordinary because they clearly lack knowledge of gay lives. To a small degree, that's understandable because most of what they were getting from the gay community was hostility, but that was quite understandable because we were feeling um, got at and not being protected. Uh, we explored every avenue we could, but the frustrating thing was we still never actually knew what actually happened in those last hours of his life. There came a point where we had to close the inquiry uh, effectively. With the investigation shelved, it seemed Ireland had got away with it. For the next two months, he laid low. But his taste for murder would soon return. Then I've reached a point where I'd, I can just stop myself. In some moods, I'm quite happy to burn the world down as possible. Very cold street, deep street. On New Year's Day 1993, Colin Ireland had resolved to become a serial killer. By March that year, he was on his way, having claimed his first victim. I'm probably 60, 70% quite a reasonable human being most of the time. But there's, there is that side of my character that is negative, it's quite cold and calculating. At the time of the murders, Ireland was living in South End. He'd moved here after splitting up from his wife, Janet Young. At the time I met him, I think I was quite a vulnerable person. I was running a pub on my own. I had two children. And he came to the pub um, to stay for bed and breakfast. And he came into the doorway and he just completely filled the entire doorway. And the whole conversation in the pub just stopped. He was controlling, he took over, he picked up on the things I needed help with, and it, he just seemed an answer to a prayer at the time. The couple wed shortly afterwards, but within four months it was over. In breaking up, Ireland showed a ruthlessness that shocked his family. We had a busy Easter in the pub and everything was fine, so after Easter we decided we'd have a few days off. So we drove up to London. Um, I got on the bus with the children because that was convenient. He went off, as I thought, to South End to stay with his friends. Um, but when he didn't come to pick us up on the Sunday, we had a bit of a panic and we phoned to make sure he had, wasn't in hospital. And they said, oh, well, he came and said that the bailiffs were coming, so he was taking everything to a safe place. So naturally, everybody let him take virtually everything that I owned um, and he cleared out all the bank accounts took my car took our wedding album I think mainly so he could say to the next person look I'm a really normal well put together man this is my ex-wife this is my children by the summer of 1993 Ireland was anything but a normal well put together man he'd killed once and was preparing to do so again Police investigation into Peter Walker's murder had come to a standstill. Ireland's meticulous clean-up routine had wiped the scene of any forensic clues, and detectives had failed to find any witnesses within London's gay community. In June, Ireland felt confident enough to pay another visit to the Colherne pub in Fulham. Once inside the well-known gay haunt, 
he struck up conversation with another customer, 37-year-old librarian, Christopher Dunn.